to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everyone and let the roll reflect. Majority of our council members are present and a quorum has, a bes has been established with the absence of council member House. This evening we have a proclamation recognizing Arbor Day and we'll start with council member Pemble. Whereas the city of Hastings declares Friday, April 28th as Arbor Day and. Whereas the city of Hastings has celebrated Arbor Day since 1997, planting trees in different parks and spaces identified by the city forester and. Whereas the purpose of Arbor Day is to encourage and educate Hastings residents in tree planting, developing civic pride and a sense of community and. Whereas Arbor Day 2023 will be held at Gretton Park Friday, April 28th from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. and... Whereas 10 trees will be planted, mulched, and watered, and... Should I read the next? Whereas Arbor Day 2023 is a particular... A partially sponsored by Dakota Electric Association and Hoffman, McNamara, and the City of Hastings, it is appreciated that these civic-minded groups to help make this event possible and whereas the city of Hastings has been recognized as a tree city USA community by the National Arbor Day Foundation since 1997 celebrating 26 years and now therefore be it resolved that I mayor of the city of Hastings do hereby proclaim April 28th as Arbor Day in Hastings adopted by the city council the city of Hastings Minnesota this third day of April 2023. Thank you, Council. Uh, tonight we will have um, Council members. Are there any corrections to the minutes of March 20th meeting? Okay. Tonight we will have comments from the audience. Is there anyone wishing to speak to the Council at this time? If you would, please step forward to the podium, state your name and address, and Explain to us your comments. Thank you. Push this too. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you, honorable council members and uh, mayor. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, we're, uh, we're speaking on behalf of several neighbors. Not everyone was able to be here tonight. Could you state your name? Ah, yes. Raymond Menard, 906 East 1st Street. Cynthia Carl, 102 Washington Street. Thank you. Um, we, we're bringing to uh, the attention of the full council items that we've brought to the attention of the Planning Commission in the past. And we've had uh, uh, people from Streets and Water down to visit the site and have agreed that what we're saying is there and real. Uh, and that can be verified. We've also talked to the Planning Commission as well. And so this is an issue that has been ongoing for some time. It's raised by the flood uh, that's pending potentially for us as well. So this is a block between uh, Franklin and Washington and First and Second Street. In the middle of this block is literally the lowest lot in the city of Hastings. Probably the lowest lot in the metro area because here we are at the drainage area. Um, it's an empty lot at the present time. Uh, there are in this block three garages and one house that are lower than the houses on First Street on the river, which are listed in the flood issues, but every year this area gets missed as a subject. Um, so that's not there. When the city put in the streets, sewer, gutters down in that part of town, I actually lived there and so did Cynthia, they raised the streets all around this block. And so the block was left low. And there's an alley between Franklin and Washington, which literally goes downhill to the center. And all of the water in this block flows into this low spot. There's a culvert out of this area into the river. There's also a culvert into the block on Washington, across Washington Street. So now we have another block's water coming to this block as well. 
we have two issues here. Um, when it rains, it doesn't have to rain that hard. It is a river here. It's a huge amount of water that flows because all of this happens. And as houses have been added to this block, we have a lot of hard surface now in roofs and driveways and such. So an enormous amount of water that comes flowing into it. So the rain creates huge amounts of water. That's problem one. When we have a flood, they plug the culvert with a balloon. And that's been done quite a number of times since uh, we've lived there. And that helps to keep the river from backing up into the lot. Helps, because the river still seeps up slowly. But as this is plugged, no longer can rainwater exit the lot. And so, this is weird, but literally, the lot fills with more water than the flood because the rain fills it up. And we've had uh, the city come down with pumps a number of times and pump it out to keep the house and the, and the garages from being flooded, although the garages have been flooded in 2001. The amount of water that's flowing is so enormous uh, that the little pump that they've tried doesn't work. They end up renting some monstrous pump uh, to try to keep up with it. Um, so we, ha <clears throat> excuse me, we have three asks. One is for the city to be ready to pump this year. In the past, that's forgotten, and so it's like an emergency at the last minute. So to have a pump ready for it. Um, the second is we've had conversations with the city about uh, actions that could be taken to s mitigate the amount of water that's flowing, like closing the culvert into it, raising the alley, these kinds of things could be done, putting a gutter in the alley so it flows out to the streets. So there's some actions there that could be done. And we're willing to cooperate and help with that. And I understand we even have to pay some taxes to, to do it. We're happy to do that. And third, we've talked to the city also about a third step. This empty lot is slated by a, a developer to build a house on it, which is going to increase the problem we face, more hard surface, less place for it to flow, less drainage area, et cetera, less ponding space, on and on and on. Um, and we've talked to the city about that. And the landowners on each side of the lot, we're willing to pay a reasonable price for an unbuilt lot um, and dedicate it to a ponding basin. And so meet the city's needs there. We were told by the city that this is actually a positive thing. There's pressure from the state and from the county to create more uh, drainage areas like this, more wetlands, and they would like that. And we're happy to dedicate it so it can never be built on, just protect it as a drainage area. So those are our three requests. Any questions? Anything I missed? Nope, he's got it all. It's good. <laughs> Thank you both for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know Erica was coming up with me. She scared me earlier. <laughs> so uh, my name is Bob Majeski, long-time resident of Hastings. Um, Erica is my daughter-in-law. Um, speaking kind of in their behalf, uh, from my recollection, plus uh, parts of it will be about neighbors, which I obviously respect and care for down where we're. Bob, could you please give your both addresses, please? My what? Your addresses. Oh, my address is 1800 Brittany Road, and the area I'm talking about is where I grew up at and where my kids currently live. Uh, my address is 2925 4th Street East. Okay. Thank you. Yep, sorry. Um, so I'm here for those reasons, basically, and I'm talking about uh, a part of 4th Street that floods quite often down in that area. Um, before I go too far, though, I want to make sure I acknowledge Tina Fulch, who I've been dealing with a little bit here on the side. Uh, when I brought this up to her, she was more than willing to take a look at this area. I explained to her what we went through. I even drove through part of the area that I'll be talking about briefly, and she's just been super to deal with. So I thank you, Tina, for your, your understanding and cooperation on all this. Uh, so anyway, the elevation we're talking about at the end of 
towards the end of uh, 4th Street is 16.9 feet from the base of the Mississippi River. Now, it doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but to put in perspective, there's some areas such as walking paths along the Mississippi that get flooded at this time. The steps uh, down by the Memorial Park area comes up quite high there. Probably the most notary one is the uh, under tunnel or under pathway underneath the bridge along the river there on First Street. So when those start getting effective, their road is flooded. So what happens when their road is flooded down there? Basically, there's one way in and one way out currently, and that's it. So when that road goes, the school buses can't come down, the garbage can't come down, deliveries can't come down. Uh, so what do they do? What they've taken upon themselves, the Likes family and the Majeskis family that live down there currently, and there's Tom Ritter lives down there currently too, and he'll be a part of this, no doubt, is I believe Pete's the one that has some easement through some DNR property. And the easement allows us to go through there. And so what they do is, and they'll be doing that real soon because it will flood this year, I'm afraid, again. Um, and the reason why I say that, if you looked at past 20 crests and the report that I got from somebody here, Tina maybe, uh, 11 of those were flood staged to that road of those top 20. Or not top 20, but 20 mentioned in the last few years. So is there a 50% chance it's going to go again? And it's going to. So what they do is they get together with the, unbeknownst to the DNR, at least with the DNR permission to go through there, and they start taking the chainsaws out and they start cutting limbs and there's broken trees down. They have to remove all them. They're going to be battling buckthorn and it's all rock in this area too. So it's rock and buff, buckthorn and fallen trees. And they create a path. And the path is probably, I don't know, Pete, maybe, maybe 20, 12 feet wide. 12 feet wide and probably about six blocks long. Okay, to give you an idea. The part that floods is about four blocks long. Okay, so they go out there and they do this and they're willing to do it. I'm not here complaining about what they have to do these are good people that will do what they have to do to get their families to daycare, to get their families to school, to haul the garbage up where the garbage will pick it up, to haul the kids up to where the bus will meet a bat every day until the water goes down, which is weeks. Now, when I grew up down there and everything else, it was very similar. And, you know, so part of my question is, is how long does this have to go on? Um, on the path road, that's about... 10, 12 feet wide, it works out all right. They're already stockpiling wood chips because this is rock. And so imagine taking your nice vehicles and driving through a pasture with rock as a foundation. So what do they do? They collect chips and try to bury them and bury the mud pits that are gonna formulate if the spring rains hit and stuff like that, they still gotta go through because there's six families down there and they all work as 12 cars on a good day going one direction and 12 cars coming back going one direction. But we also have Timmy Likes here who runs a business. He's got trailers he's got to move. He's got to do repairs on things. He's got to move stuff out from where he's at for his family to keep business going. And Pete's similar. He's got hobbies that he's got to do and everybody's got stuff to do. And that's okay. They're willing to try to do it, but I remember walking that path 65 years ago, trying to get to school. I remember there was a wood bridge down there, and I remember when I was a little kid, it flooded on both sides. So I was too little to roll up my pants, so I had to take my pants off, my socks off, my shoes off, and walk on the water on one side, because it was on both sides of the bridge at the time, my oldest brother used to get on the bridge and jump. He'd say, oh, it's okay for you now to come across. And we'd cross one at a time. That's been repaired. There's a beautiful bridge down there now. Okay? But why do they still have to go through a pasture 60 years later 
just to get food, just to take the kids to school, do those simple things. How long an area? It's about four blocks. It's about four blocks long. So what can be done? I'm not an engineer, okay? I'm a crabby old grandpa this time of year. If you know what used to get me through this time is Johnny Cash's old song, Five Feet High and Rising. <laughs> on the way home, if you're bored, you look it up on your phone. I was a little boy in the song, always asking, how high is the water, mama? <laughs> and that's what the song is about. Because you didn't know what you had to do the next day. I got kids that age that are thinking the same way. What are we going to do if it gets higher? When do we got to go through the pasture? Now, that 10 foot wide area is okay until you meet another car. Now there's buckthorn growing up. So whose car is gonna take a nosedive into a buckthorn patch to let the other one go? Or if you're pulling a tra trailer, you can't back that up. You're gonna have to do something to get the heck out of their way so he can get to work and get his family going. Okay, but that's okay. They'll do the best they can with what they got but for how long does it got to be this way? One generation, I hope would be enough. Now it's going to be two generations. I don't know. So, um, I had a, that's okay, I guess. Uh, my son's house burned down down there, I don't know, five, six years ago probably. And it was a beautiful summer day out and everything else, and all of a sudden it caught fire and burned down. We had three units. Uh, Meeseville, Hastings, and Prescott responded to it, and they worked their tail off to try to get that house out and couldn't. Nobody was hurt. Houses can be rebuilt. But what happens if the water was up and somebody was hurt? Somebody was trapped, needed that ambulance service or that fire truck. The fire truck, as, as much confidence and trust I have, with the fire rescue uh, and um, ambulance service in town here. I know the cops could get down there, okay? Fire truck, no way, no way. They'd run into a tree. Ambulance, I don't know. How low are the branches hanging down? How high do you cut them off to just let them go? You know, it'd be terrible. And we're talking four blocks long for 60 some years, okay? So that's my biggest fear. That's why I'm talking, living on Brittany Road about my grandkids and people I love down there and people that I respect down there. What can we do to help six families have a good chance of going another day without worrying about flood and everything else? I know the people on First Street God bless their hearts and everything else, they're going to work their tails off again. And they're willing to do that. Okay? These families living down there are going to work their tails off again. Bless their hearts for doing that. What I'm asking for is help to solve a solvable problem. Okay? We can't fight the Mississippi, okay, but we can sure give them a chance to get out of the Mississippi's way. So, I want you to think about that, and you know, talk about a new road and everything else. Like I said, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a designer, but realistically, if you went ever went down there, and I hope you do, the part I'm in questioning, if you move the road, probably 50 yards on one end and 10 yards on the other for three blocks, it's solved. That's it. So, please consider this. And please take a drive down there because it's a beautiful area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Majeski. Thank you. I got a question for him. Oops. Let me grab this out of your way before I interrupt you again. Um, Sorry. Bob? Yeah. Councilmember Leifelt would ask you a question. Between the two of you, I'm thinking someone might be able to answer this. On, so, what year was that? Bridge redone down there. 1987. The, the way that it got done was Jim Kleinschmidt was a uh, road and bridge guy here, and I ran into a guy by the name Van Gilder. He was working in the Presbyterian Cemetery in the south end of town, and I went up to him and we were talking. He says, "Where do you live?" I told him I live down 3000 East Fourth Street. My name is Pete Likes. 
He says, you live down there where the condemned bridge is. The bridge that we walked across, drove across in 1953 was condemned. They weren't even supposed to be running the school buses across it. So I came down here to Mr. Kleinschmidt's office, as Mr. Van Gilder told me, he says, tell him to tip the pile over. So I came into Jim's office and said, Jim, Pete likes tip the pile over. We tipped the pile over. There was the funding for the bridge that they put in down there in 1987. I don't think the city had to pay $10,000, but that bridge cost was like $77,000 when they put it in. So question for you guys. At that time, was there discussion with the city about fixing the road? No, this is what happened. When they did 15th Street going up uh, towards the golf course, when they, when they put the sewer and water in there, Cal Rudy was the superintendent, Butch Kane was the super, assistant superintendent of the road and bridge. They came to us and they said, we got filled for East 4th Street. Yeah, so they started trucking it from knoll to knoll. Because if you, when you drive down that road, the road was lower than the barbed wire fences on the north side of that road. They hauled in for like a month. All of a sudden, the Corps of Engineers caught wind of it. Oh, they're filling the floodplain. It's not the DNR, it's the Corps of Engineers that's controlling that road down there. And like Bob said, there's probably less than 1,000 feet from bluff to bluff that they could continue to build up. <coughs> but the, the Corps of Engineers shut them down. Okay, follow-up question But if you go you across any other part of the state of Minnesota, they seem to make, they make provisions for those kinds of things. They allow you to build permanent dikes. There's permanent dikes along the Mississippi River. That, and and well, not up the same car, but you go up Mississippi, they put permanent dikes in place to protect the business of the industries that are there. But when it comes to a thousand feet, they, sh they shut it off. I control the easement, my wife and I, we have the easement to that pasture that we talk about, the 10 foot. We've asked the Corps of Engineers, we've asked the DNR, we've asked the state of Minnesota, who bought, why can't we put gravel in there? Because they don't want to ruin the aesthetic value of that three block area okay question for you hold on um so as going forward because what you guys are saying is amazing i've been here you can sit down bob yeah. <laughs> you're not going to get a word in anyway he can come up so, and talk so question whatever. for yes. you then just going forward pete so as the city looks at this clearly there's an issue with the army corps of engineers that so would it's, need a to, it's a core, it's a core so it's of a core engineers. Or, yeah, okay. They they, they, they shut that down, okay. okay? But the thing is, when they're going to build your new sewage disposal plant over there down off of 10th Street, there's going to be some provisions that they're going to have to make to get, to get their stuff to go out to the river. We're aware of that because we're the property owners. We've been involved in it. We know what's going on. Other. But the thing, we're, what, we're, what we're asking the city to do is probably three different things, okay? You can address the Corps of Engineers, and you can tell them you're talking 1,000 feet of roadway, and you've got to raise it up basically another six feet, seven feet maybe. That way it makes it compatible. When, you put the, when they put the bridge deck in down there in 1987, they put the bridge deck in at the height of the 1965 flood, which was 790. So that, and that has a floating deck on top of it. So when the water starts to hit the guidons underneath that bridge, you can't drive across it. You got to park your car on one side and walk across it. So we're well versed because Bob grew up down there. I moved in there in 70, whatever, 77, whatever. My wife's lived down. We're, we're a family down there and we work together. But the thing is we're here now because like Erica's sitting here, my kids sitting back there, they got grandkids. He's got grandkids. These kids have to go to school. They have to pick up the garbage, okay? The city, we were aware as were the Majeskis, we were aware of that when we built these houses, but you know what? If something goes down, something goes readily awry down there, the city of Hastings is gonna be called on the carpet. If somebody gets, somebody, if somebody would burn up in a fire down there, you can't get the fire truck through, the ambulance through, in the high water, somebody's gonna to have to pay. You, grant, you granted those permits. We've, we came into the compliance, we built one foot above the 65 flood on the houses that we built down there, so we're not gonna flood. If we get water, if Tim gets water in his basement at 696 feet, the floor in the nuclear power plant down at Treasure Island is 695 feet. They're gonna have, more one, they're gonna have one foot more water on their floor than Tim's gonna have in his water, on his floor. So we're aware of, I'd like to thank Tina for sending out that information today because I'm glad that Bob came here because 
He lived there before I did, and he understands it. He used to have to get in the boat to cross the Vermilion River at the bridge to go to school. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> when we got married, we had to ride the boat out of the cornfield, come up the river, and park in the harbor just to go to work in 1978, 79. So, I mean, we're, 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 well, we're aware of what has to happen down there. If anything, the city should tell, they should go after the state of Minnesota because they're going to come back and say, you issued the permit. You said, yeah, we issued the permit. You took the tax dollars for that. Okay, let us put gravel on that road that's go through that pasture. And when you get down to that, then you can turn around. You can say, how about if we let's negotiate how high we can raise that road from bluff to bluff, the 1,000 feet, 12, 20 feet wide? The city had all kinds of fill, and the, the, the DNR and the Corps of Engineers shut them down. And if you go back and look at the annual time, what's happened in the state, Dave Pemmel can attest to it because he's over the shake his head because he knows, he, he knows what I'm talking about, okay? Some of you have not been around this area this long, but I'm born and raised here. Bob, born and raised here. Raymond, Ar Raymond Ards, he's born and raised here. Cindy Carl, Roger Reuter. We're aware of it. We, we understand. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Cowtown, okay? Because we live on the far east end of Cowtown. When the water comes up, we asked the city, me being the president of the association, we would like a sign at 2nd Street saying, residents only. Everybody wants to come down and look at the water. In 1965, when my wife's dad's house was wrapped in plastic and he saved it, you wouldn't believe the people that came down there just to see what's going on. We don't need that down there. First Street was built up as a dike after the 1969 flood, Raj, right? Yeah. 1969. First Street from Plans Corner all the way up to Hazelson Shop, that was a dike. That's why those houses on the north side of the road, where that, they got the new house that's down there now, he could only go to the 1965 flood level. The, the, the elevations around those houses, the elevations are in our heads because we know. We know you can walk down to the pole, we'll point to, we'll, we'll show you on the power pole where the water was in 1965. We've seen it. So we're asking the city number one to get, Consider asking the Corps of Engineers or the, whoever runs that little particle of land that we got from Friday Take the easement on, why can't we gravel it? You can put, you can put J strips up at the end of it, or those J, those J things at the end of the season, block it off. If you want to walk in there, walk in there. But rather than put one on each end, put two on each end because then it goes from fence to fence and you can't get through. And the second thing is to go back to the Corps of Engineers or whoever runs that lower road down there. What's a thousand feet of gravel six feet high? I mean, especially when it's free. It was free in 1906 when, when they built that road up. And then they come down and say, oh, you can't fill a floodplain. Yeah? How many floodplains have they filled? <laughs> Dave's laughing, okay? Because he knows. How many floodplains have been filled with that? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lakes. Anyone else wish to speak to the council at this time? Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and sure. it, it, with you tonight. Uh, um, well, my problem isn't too much water. Um, could you please my, state your name and address? Oh, excuse me. Uh, I'm John Consemius, and I live 10 miles south of here in, in Douglas Township. And uh, I'm in the Hastings School District. I, I went to school at Hastings here for all 12 years. And so, and my folks went to, went, went to here, so I've been long time citizens of this area. But, but anyway, I happen to be a farmer. I farmed all my life, and I happen to farm some land right close to Hastings. And over the years, uh, I've raised corn for a dollar a bushel, and I've raised, raised corn for seven dollars a bushel. And right now, it's seven dollars a bushel, you know, where it was six dollars, last fall it was, and six dollars right now. But I'm, when I'm concerned, I'm, if you look at food prices, what, how food is, is going up so much, and everything starts on our soil, what we produce. And we have some of the best soil right outside 
right next to our city limits, that we can raise two crops of vegetables in the same year. And we've been, we've been doing that for. And on that sheet, it says that one, on one acre will produce $15,000 of food that's sold in the grocery store. Now, the farmer doesn't get all that money, but there's a lot of people involved in that $15,000. We have land prices, we have fertilizer prices, we have machinery prices. We have people that we, that we hire or buy from to, to get our, our farm supplies. And even the, I mean, the grocery store has to, has to do it. And so we need, we need grocery stores and we need food. And, but the thing is, I spent four years on Metropolitan Council. And I've talked about this to try to save farmland because we're losing so much farmland in, 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 our, in our state. And once you have the best kind of farmland, you surely hate to use it. And the reason why we have such a good farmland is because we have irrigation. And we're really fortunate because we're right next to the Mississippi River. And we have a good underground. I have the records to show you how, how our water supply is so we won't, we won't hurt your wells or nothing like that. But I just thought that now those papers I show you, there's, there's some people who want to develop this and pour concrete on it. And so in time, you're going to have me voting on it. Do you, do you want to destroy that and put a house on it? I was, when I was on the Met Council, I talked about it many times, and everybody, but we, we couldn't make any rules or, you know, we can't vote on anything. We just more or less expressed our opinion. But uh, I think that we always thought the best thing to do is right now, if you want to build more homes, you can't build right south of our, of our city because that's some of the best land, because it's level land, it's sandy land, and, and with water, we're really blessed. There's, there, there's about, they say about one-tenth of the land in Minnesota is irrigated, and we have some of the best of it. So uh, uh, Dakota County is, is more, more irrigation than anybody at their county in the state. I was on the state irrigation board of directors for many years, and uh, I don't know, I'm not a speaker, but I just want to express your idea. So when you come to vote, I think we've got to save this good farmland. And if you want to build more houses, you should cross the bridge and go over and go up 95 Washington County. We all agree to that because that land is up and down. It's got rocks, it's got wet holes and stuff. Where we don't have that out here. We have nice level land, it's beautiful. And it's a heck of a place to build a house on a sandy piece of ground. I mean, so ask that woman, I think, she'll want to build in a rolling area. But, uh, so, and that, that land along, I mean, it, it's still in the Hastings School District. And uh, I, I just, I think it's a mortal sin if we, if we keep building that way and we don't go about that way. Because if you build houses out there, they can bicycle to work then. And we'll have to build a new bridge, you know, with all the traffic that's going to go down Vermillion Street. I mean, I traveled this road. I'm 89 years old, and I, I know Hastings pretty well. But I just like to tell you my, my two cents were so. Thank you, John. For I want to appreciate comments. for your your time. Sure. If there's any questions, we be glad to try to answer them. I don't think so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diane Likes. I live at 3000 East 4th Street. I guess one concern I have is if they're putting an emergency vehicle on the other side of the tracks by the church, if there is a train on the tracks, how long could you estimate for an emergency vehicle to get to the east end, and how is somebody going to get from the other side over to the emergency vehicle? Are they going to crawl under the train? Are they going to uh, go between the train? 
And are, it, are they going to keep the trains at uh, minimal length? Because we have waited for a good half hour, 45 minutes, before anybody can get through to get to the other side. And they always give us a number, who to call, to let them know what's going on, but we never get an answer from the railroad. So i just like to know how, how, and I know you can't give a firm answer, but how long would it take to break up that train to get an emergency vehicle down there and also somebody to get on the other side and get into that emergency vehicle? Thank you. Pete Lakes, once again. We talked about the length of the trains, you mentioned that, and, and the last time we had the flood was like 2019, whatever, something like that. So we asked the Sioux, or the Canadian Pacific, whoever runs that show down there, we asked them, um, how do you dictate as to how long the trains can be? And it's dictated between the tower over here, the Saint, they call it the St. Croix Tower, that goes along because that's where they split the railroad between the Burlington Northern and the Canadian Pacific and whoever else. So uh, I, I wanna say they said something, that it could, a, a train could be 115 cars long from, point, from that point. At 118 cars, the second street crossing is plugged, okay? So then 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the city took the third street crossing out. They, they, they gave in to what the railroad says, we'll give you a new landing and we'll give you the stop arms if you close the third street crossing. The thing is the third street crossing in an emergency situation at this point in time, that could be used. It could be governed. They could put up temporary lights. Then if you have the 117, 18 cars waiting to go through the tower over there, they can use the third street crossing as an emergency access to do that. It's something that the city's gonna have to work out with the railroad lines. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to the council? Okay, then council members, are there any council items to be considered? And council, I would accept a motion to Accept the consent agenda. Yeah. Council Member Fulch. Thank you, Your Honor. I was going to request that uh, to pull three items from the consent agenda for uh, for consider for further consideration. Uh, number 13, uh, the second reading of City Code Amendment uh, Chapter 34, the fee schedule regarding cannabis and hemp businesses. Number uh, 17, the update on flood forecast and response planning steps so that. Um, we can answer the public's uh, questions in regards to the flood. And then number 18, the no wake ordinance. Thank you, Councilmember Fulch, and we'll Thank put you. those under administration. With removing those three items, could I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Councilmember Leifelt, Councilmember Fox, just discussion, Council? All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. Aye. I oppose to that motion state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. Tonight of warding of contracts and public hearings, we have our 2023 neighborhood infrastructure improvements. And for this item, we will have an introduction by Public Works Director Ryan Stemsky, followed by a public hearing and partial action by the council. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, Mayor, members of the council, as stated tonight, we're here to conduct the hearing for the 2023 neighborhood infrastructure improvements. Um, item of note, the resolution in your packets, um, tonight we will be ordering the improvements and adopting the assessment role. So I just want everybody to note that um, because of the supermajority requirement we have for ordering 
of the improvements. We didn't do that at the last hearing last month. And so that's placed on the resolution tonight. Um, so the vote would need uh, to pass. The resolution would need a super majority, which would be six council members. So I just state that before we, we get rolling here. Um, jumping right into the presentation, the neighborhood that we're talking about, again, um, same neighborhood as we talked about during the improvement hearing, Pleasant Drive is the dominant street um, with several of the side streets as noted in the, in the mapping in your pa packets. Um, predominantly a reconstruct, but we also have uh, uh, some reclamation improvements to, to combine um, the, the total improvements out on the project. Just a recap of the cost, the total project cost is about $4.3 million for this project, um, of which you can see the portion of assessments that we're talking about tonight is, is approximately or close to $500,000. So our approach to assessment this year is a little bit different. Um, we, we looked at the lots in this year's neighborhood and they were extremely curvilinear, um, non-standard, uh, a lot of different front footages. And so we had to dig into the ordinance um, and try to find a, a, the most equitable way to distribute assessments. And what we're drawing upon is the city ordinance that talks about lots whose shapes are irregular, a per lot assessment basis may be used in lieu, in lieu of the formulas. So typically we're finding a, a per foot cost and multiplying that by the frontage of the property in question. This year a little differently. The recommendation from staff, the recommendation from our operations committee is to use a per lot assessment just because of the irregularity. I'll show you some of those as we get into some future slides, but um, I, want, I want us to have that in mind. Again, we did use our third party consultant in our uh, appraisal analysis. This year we used Patch, Patch and Mesner. We've used them several times in the past. They do good quality work for us, um, but they provided a special benefit for the property type in question and the improvement done. So we give them the list of improvements, reconstruction, reclaims, and they, and they um, provide those property values up front. So, and that's where we established through that appraisal analysis a per lot rate for each improvement and property type. Again, in our ordinance, we carried forward the corner lots. If improvements are being done on both sides, the short side of the lot gets 100% of the assessment and then the long side gets the 25%, which gives uh, folks a break that, that live on those true corner lots. And then this year in the assessment analysis, um, it's notable that there was no back lot assessment. So um, there's several homes that um, are along Pleasant Drive, for example, but it's the rear of the lots that has some screening and buffering and they access off of a different city street. So no benefit, so we were, deemed from the appraisal report, so we're pulling those back lot assessments out of the assessment role. Okay, so here's an example of some of the irregularity I'm talking about. This irregularity example is on Old Bridge Lane. Um, you can tell, you can tell if, if we were dealing with our front footage method, it could range on these similar size lots from zero feet to 300 feet. Very difficult to apply a front footage very fairly and equitably. Um, you can see a lot um, 2522 has a shared driveway, but uh, technically zero frontage along the road. We can also see a curvilinear lot here on the corner, 2527, has over 300 feet of footage. So just trying to, trying to show you guys the, the, the variety that we are trying to deal with. And so that's why the per lot assessment was, was very um, applicable to these neighborhoods. Uh, here's an example too along Old Bridge these homes that are between Old Bridge and Pleasant. Uh, driveway access is all along Old Bridge. Um, you can see the screening of trees and the, and the distance um, from Pleasant Drive and therefore rather than giving them assessment along Pleasant Drive, their assessment is focused on the, the Old Bridge access point that they access from. Just another example along Southview Place, again, um, front footage range, ranging from 70 feet up to nearly 300 feet, just because of the, the plat shapes and, and the shapes of these, these front lots. Um, 
So that brings us to our per lot assessment rate. It's pretty straightforward out of the assessment analysis. Sink for a single family home, that's a standard lot. Standard lot meaning it's not a corner lot. It has um, one road being improved in front of it. For a reconstruction phase of the project, $7,650 per lot. Moving to the reclaimed streets, the single family standard home uh, assessment rate is $6,750 per lot. Um, like I said, the standard lots do not have the uh, corner lot uh, calculation in them. Just for reference, the appraisal analysis gave us a range of improvements. Uh, for the reconstruction lots, it's $8,500 to $9,000 per lot. And for the reclaimed lots, it was $7,500 to $8,000 per lot. But again, applying the um, uh, formulas in the essence of our ordinance, we take the low end of that range and then we take knock 10% off of it. So those values are 90% of the low range just to um, apply the, the appraiser's recommendation. We come in a little below that mark is where we've set these historically. Doing the same thing here on the per lot assessment. Some unique properties, um, we do have St. Philip's Church on the north end of the project. This is a uh, over five acre lot. The appraiser looks at the highest and best use for these types of lots um, and ran the analysis through on that basis. Obviously they subtract what it would take to develop the property and, and do some splits um, and they look at the current zoning. The assessment for this entire parcel was $41,400 and so that's, that's the, uh, in the assessment analysis and calculated in the role for this particular lot. And then on the south end of the project, we have um, agricultural land and we have current zone, this is south of the bridge down off of 46. The current zoning is guided at one unit per 10 acres. So looking at the highest and best use, they really can only get one home on either of these lots. So the appraisal analysis has these each at a one unit or 6,750 because it's a reclaim in that section of roadway. Also of note, these properties are listed in, in green acres, so they would get deferred until, until that land sold and developed anyway. So, Okay, so our assessment totals out here, uh, just over $496,000. Of that, we do have Pleasant Park, so we have an assessment along the park. That totals uh, just over 50000 bringing the private assessments to um, just under $450,000. So that's how that equates. Again, it's, it's of note that because we have a collector road with not a lot of driveways along it and, and assessment along it, uh, when we run the calculation of the assessments as a percentage of the bonded debt on the project, we're actually under that 20% 20, 20 mark we try to set. The 20% 20 20 mark and above allows us to um, apply for improvement bonds to fund the project, so that's our typical um, funding methodology. In this case, since we were under 20%, we had to add a few more steps in with our financial consultants and, and use a street reconstruction bond for the project. So a little nuance there of, of how the assessment calculation applies to how we fund the project. Payment of assessments. So the assessments, if the, if the assessment role is adopted um, and we move forward with the project, the uh, payments for the assessments would begin in October. October 1st of 2023, we would, we would begin taking payments. We do accept partial payments. Um, any amounts that remain after November 30th then get certified to the county property taxes with a $50 processing fee. Um, important to note that no interest or, p or, no, no interest or fees are, are charged um, if assessments are paid in full by November 30th of the year. And that begins a, a 10 year payoff. So if you let it go through to your property taxes, um, it's paid off over 10 years, beginning the spring of 2024 would be your first installment. The interest rates right now through our financial advisors are projected to be about five or five to 6%. And to run through an example for, uh, uh, we have the majority of reclaimed lots out for our assessment role, so using a $6,750 assessment, assuming an interest rate of 5%, best guess right now, 
the, the annual amortized payment would be about $859. Breaking that down, if you escrow in that into your mortgage payment, that would be just over or nearly $72 a month is what this would mean. We do have assessment abatement or financial aid on the project, so we've set it up again this year to get that federal funding in our project bid specifications. Um, this is the community development block grant funded by the federal government, and it really is dependent on, on income levels and qualifications on that front. The city sells, sends out a comprehensive package to all the residents um, in August, so um, in advance of, of the review. Um, that, that gets sent out to the property owners. The Dakota County um, CDA or the, the Community Development Agency is actually the agency that takes those applications in and, and reviews them and determines um, qualification, financial qualifications based on their data. They will deem each application uh, for full abatement or partial abatement and apply the funds accordingly. And, and property owners would be notified that in advance of those assessment due dates in, in no, end of November. We also have assessment, assessment deferral in the city. And so this is for folks that maybe didn't qualify for the abatement, but are a senior citizen, uh, disabled or mil military personnel. Um, they need to meet that eligibility requirement and financial qualifications. So, the qualifications for defer deferment is the assessment amount um, would need to be 1% or less um, of the adjusted gross income. So if we, again, if we take that 6750, that 6750 assessment, um, it would result in an annual installment of $859. And so we'd have to take that calculation and say your adjusted gross income would need to be $85,900 or less to qualify. So that's kind of how that 1% AGI applies. If you meet that financial quali qualification plus the, the three criteria of eligibility, then you would qualify for a deferral. It is important to note that the deferment does not forgive the assessment amount like abatement does, but it, does, it, it, de it delays the payment with interest until uh, certain events occur such as if the property was sold or that status was, was deemed differently. This form would also be mailed out in the abatement package for folks so they can see it and apply. Uh, it also is available on the City of, H of Hastings website um, uh, as of now. All right, and with that, I will stand for any questions and allow the mayor to conduct the hearing. Thank you, Ryan. At this time, I'll have the public hearing start at this time is there anyone that wishes to speak to the assessment or the infrastructure project okay at this time I'll close the public hearing and council open for discussion councilmember Lund no I uh, nothing big I just want to say thank you again for um, uh, rethinking the the fee structure um, and and going at a per lot uh, approach um, I think you know we have a we have a process but sometimes it needs to be flexible and I, I appreciate that you did that and I'm sure that everybody involved is as well so thank you thank you councilmember Lund if no other councilmember Fulch um, thank you, Your Honor. I guess, Ryan, I was a little concerned about the $41,000 that was being assessed to St. Philip's Church uh, for being on the corner there. And so, you know, I thought that part of the assessment pro process was be, you know, was that the value of the property, you know, that it's like, it's factor in, you know, that the $41,000, you know, helps increase the value of that property by $41,000. And considering it's a, you know, it's a, religious institution that's not taxed. And I know that all, a lot of the local uh, churches have been you know, struggling with attendance and such. I was just um, really concerned about the financial impact to that congregation. Um, it's a longstanding, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization and we should be proud to have so many great churches in our, in our community. And so um, I, I guess, 
what I'm trying to say is, have you just had a conversation at all with the um, pastor at uh, St. Philip's, their leadership about the financial impacts, and if there's any possible, you know, financial aid that they would be um, eligible for, or any anything to that effect? Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Fulch. Yes, we we actually we have talked to them. Um, several times about some design issues and concerns they have uh, on their grounds and whatnot. Um, and we've gone through the assessment methodology with them and they were very pleasant to deal with and they were very excited for the project and they were, um, they understood the assessment and they were encouraged by the process beginning. So we, we went through and we talked about the um, appraisal analysis that was done that looked at their property specifically. And you're right, it, 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 it looks at the improvements from the current condition of the road and that increase in special benefit or that, that increase in, in property value is what's applied. And they just have such a large parcel with, with, um, with that highest potential use of 12 homes on there is how the market looks at that sort of uh, uh, an appraisal analysis. Um, and talking that through with them, they thought it was very fair and didn't have any concerns to our to us in our conversations. They, didn't have further objections. they did not have further objections. And, there, and, and state statute does not, even if they're tax exempt, they're not, um, they, they don't, they still have to, uh, uh, abide by the assessments that we we levy on the property, so they don't they don't get out of assessments either. Sure, I wasn't asking. Oh no, I no, I just you, you had brought that up. I just wanted to yeah. <laughs> clarify. No, well, thank you for that. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that you had those further conversations with the leadership of the church to make sure that that they understood fully the process and that yep. they had the opportunity to voice their concerns. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fulch, Councilmember Pimble. Yeah, Ryan, the uh, pastor and some of the leadership of St. Philip's were concerned a little bit about starting the project and it would be tied to the same week as to when they have their annual garage sale. And that was the only concern they expressed to me at that time. They were happy with everything else. I was just curious as kind of an idea that we can make sure that we give them access both ways in and out of their uh, parking area during the garage sale. Yeah, that one didn't raise to me. I didn't hear that through the, some of their additional staff discussions. Um, we don't open bids even until the end of the week. So once those bids get tabulated and we get a contractor on board and bring a contract back, then we can start having those conversations about are they starting on the south end, the north end, what accommodations could we make? I would think with their multiple access opportunities, we could figure something out and, and, and work, out, work that out with the contractor. So they've been great to work with, so we'll continue that relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Pimble. There's no other questions or, oh, okay. Motion's been made by Councilmember Leifeld and a second by Fox. Councilmember Fox, any additional discussion, Council? All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Let's see, under administration, we took the items off of the consent agenda. So first we'll hear the second reading for the city code amendment, chapter 34, the fee fit schedule for cannabis and hemp business. And for this item, Dan Watitsha will give us an introduction. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> obviously, this is uh, one step out of uh, multiple discussions and several ordinances that the council uh, has been considering with, with input from the Public Safety Advisory Commission as well as the Public Safety Committee. Um, with the, I'm sorry, I'm gonna forget which meeting date, but last meeting or two meetings ago with the council adopting uh, new licensing standards going forward for um, uh, cannabis and hemp uh, uh, related establishments. Uh, essentially there's a need to set a license fee associated with those licenses to make sure we cover costs associated with the uh, license as well as um, 
enforcement of the license and impact on the, the community. Um, the Public Safety Advisory Commission and uh, Public Safety Committee's recommendation on a retail establishment was $10,000. Um, and when this came through the committee last meeting, uh, they felt during the first reading of this ordinance, they felt that it should be reduced to 8,000, uh, a little bit more um, uh, attainable uh, by a business. Uh, the other others, the investigation fee at 500, uh, manufacturing, testing, processing, wholesale licenses of 200, cultivation license of 200, uh, were left uh, as initially recommended. But that's a quick overview of the, the ordinance before you. It's the second reading, so um, if council adopts it tonight, it would be effective upon 10 days after publication. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Councilmember Fultz. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, thank you for allowing me to pull this particular item. You know, I apologize for not being able to be at the last council meeting. I had tested positive for COVID and I didn't want to bring and share my germs with you folks. And so I apologize for not being here. But um, this particular issue uh, caught my attention the most just as the cannabis product retail license fee of being $8,000. Um, as we were going through the uh, pandemic and we had, a, I personally had a lot of conversations with our on, on our on sale liquor establishments and the struggles that they were going through and that the $4,200, you know, for the on sale, you know, liquor license for them at that time, you know, was a lot. And we kept, you know, as and I know you guys remember that we, we kept um, deferring the, the license fee. And so that $4,200 is something we got used to seeing, right, over and over and over again. And so um, personally, I do not understand why it is we would require an $8,000 cannabis product retail license when on sale liquor licenses is only $4,200. And so, um, you know, I understand that law enforcement or someone from public safety was an un, uh, unavailable at that time to be able to address, you know, questions as to why it is that that licensing fee has been established so high. But I would like to see it reduced to something that's closer to what it is um, that's reflective of what, where we're at with the on-sale uh, liquor license. You know, there's, you know, they're both controlled substances. Um, with anything, you can have abuse, you know, if it's for instance, with uh, liquor, you know, you can go and have a margarita or you can down a huge bottle of tequila, right? It's all about abuse and cannabis is the same way. Um, and so I feel very strongly that we shouldn't be uh, setting this fee so high so that, uh, you know, our business community is unable to be able to take advantage of um, beginning uh, to sell cannabis products as um, the gummies to begin with. Um, the form that's currently legal, and uh, and so I just feel that it's really unfair of the of the city to be imposing a fee structure that's so high that it discourages our business community from being able um, to acquire this license, and so I would like to see um, the license be reflective, you know, as the same as it is for the on-sale liquor license. And I don't know how many years that that's been at $4,200, but it was during the pandemic, right? So it's been at least, I don't know, three years that we've held it about that rate. And so um, I would personally um, advocate that we lower it further from the $8,000. And um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, offer that up for further consideration since folks have had the opportunity since the last council meeting to think about that a little bit further. And so um, I'll make a motion to um, reduce that, but I just wanted to first give the opportunity for, for council consideration. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Fulch. At this time, I'm gonna ask Councilor to speak to us. It is a motion. I will make a motion, but I first wanted to hear your thoughts about the, the matter. I wasn't at the last council meeting. I mean, I listened to it online, but um, 
as I had said, there wasn't a public safety representative that was able to, I mean, it's one thing if, if we feel that, okay, this is gonna take twice as much enforcement as on sale liquor licenses does, you know, that the fee would have to be higher. But I mean, as far as I can tell, I mean, the only enforcement that we would really be doing is the same as that we would do with liquor licenses, whereas we'd be doing the, you know, the compliance checks for to make sure that they're not selling to, you know, folks under age 21. I don't know if, you know, you're like, you're going to send a personal undercover shopper to go look to make sure that the, you know, that the dosages of the packaging, you know, are exactly what it is that's, you know, allowable within the state of Minnesota. I don't know what it is that you're envisioning, but I would really want to make sure that there is a justification for setting something so high, that the bar is so high that it actually prohibits our business community from being able, you know, to take advantage of this opportunity to sell um, cannabis products that are legal within the state of Minnesota at this point. So um, that's where I'm at right now. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Fulch. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Members of the Council, I, I think there is a difference, uh, Councilmember Fulch, between a very regulated liquor uh, product that is tested, that is uh, stamped, that is required to be licensed by the state of Minnesota before it can be sold in any liquor store or liquor establishment, and a completely unregulated CBD product that the state of Minnesota does not test. They do not regulate. They tell what the packaging requirements have to be, but they don't monitor them, and they have said they will not enforce them um, because there's no mechanism to do that. So it is left to local law enforcement to look at all of the products. And I can guarantee you that there are about 90% of the stores that are selling them today that are not truly complying with the current Minnesota law, and they are selling products over the dosage that they should be allowed to sell. And so this is a new territory. It is going to require a special drug recognition expert from our law enforcement police department to uh, monitor, to test, to do the compliance checks, as well as to look at all of the products to make sure that our, our establishments are complying with the law because no one else is. So this initial license, I think it's justified to have a higher fee. What that fee is, maybe 8,000 is a little too high. I don't know. But I do believe it is different than liquor. And so that is, that's my position on it, but obviously the council can do what they want. Thank you, Councilor. Additional discussion. I think all, yeah, thank you, Your Honor. I think also neighboring cities were higher. I mean, that's where, where the 10,000 was derived was, was some neighboring, was it even Cottage Grove? I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's not like we are on an island with that. The, you know, those businesses that are, I don't want to say the word, well, those businesses that are they're going to take it the most serious and, and be the, the, the best partners in this are, are, are those that will be able to, to manage a, a larger fee, too. It's not necessarily to dissuade people, but that's, there is part of that in, involved in, in any fee structure, too, is, is serious businesses coming, to, coming through and not just a free license to play. So um, we, we talked about it, and we down... We shifted down on the ten thousand dollars that was proposed because we, kind of along your line, lines of thought, um, and it, there is no perfect science to the number, um, you know, seventy-eight fifty or whatever, you know. It, but um, I think the the logic um, is 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 sound in what what council just said as well. So. That's, I, I think it's fine where it, where it is, and we can, always, we can always revise it and revisit it later. We don't know a lot at this point in time. Thank you, Councilmember Lund. Councilmember Pemble. I think part of the aspect of looking at this is, you know, we don't have a good base, and as the, um, was stated, you know, there's not... It's not regulated by the state. It's not going to be regulated by the state. They've laid out these guidelines. Who knows what's going to come of this when it gets to be May 20th and the session is over with. It's, it's like I think that we need to kind of steady the process and say, okay, if, if we're going from 10,000 down to eight, 
I can I can live with that for right now and see what the process as the legislative session ends and what transpires moving forward. This is probably going to take tweaks of the ordinances moving forward, but this is, I think, a good base to start with, and we should move this ahead as it's now written. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Pamel. Councilmember Fox. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I do, um, I, I'm a business owner, and I pay a lot of fees, and they are prohibitive two things. So I, I want to honor that sentiment um, that um, a, an $8,000 fee is not only going to be hard for people to pay who are serious about it, but it's going to stop businesses from opening to be serious about their, their actions. So I, I do want to want to justify that as, as a, a person that feels that. Um, we, um, we often talk about how we can go back and tweak ordinances. And um, in my short tenure up on the dais, we really have never done that. So I'm a little bit remiss to say that we can go back and, and tweak it along the way. Of course we will if it's, if it's hugely problematic. But if we want to see businesses try and open and thrive, we, we should create a, an environment that they can do so. So that's my sentiment. Um, and with that, I, um, I will continue this conversation and make a motion to um, amend it to $6,000. I'll second that. Okay. First and second council by Councilmember Fox and second by Councilmember Fulch. Member Fulch. Oh, Thank you, Your Honor. Just, you know, one other comment. I think that uh, it's important, you know, not to uh, create barriers for, you know, the sale of it, you know, within our community. Personally, I, uh, I think that there are a lot of similarities between liquor sales and cannabis. It's all about, you know, self-regulation and how much that you're taking and being aware, you know, we all know that a uh, you know, like a Coors Light is not as strong as a Long Island tea, right? You know, and it's all about personal responsibility and reading packaging and trial and error. And so I don't feel that we should be uh, penalizing the business community at this point um, by, you know, setting a threshold, that which what I just kind of heard was a little arbitrary. Like we didn't actually have any figures behind to justify the $8,000. Um, in fees, and so, and personally, I feel that, um, you know, that this is one step that we can take, uh, you know, to help, I think it's a public safety issue in allowing um, legalized uh, cannabis within our community. We all know that opioids and methamphetamines, other illegal drugs that can be laced with other awful things are extremely dangerous, and so I would personally rather see that we have outlets that are within our community to be selling uh, safe cannabis products uh, to the public for folks that don't, um, you know, enjoy liquor uh, as, a, as, a, as a controlled substance. And so um, I just think that, uh, you know, if I think that we should err closer on making it a, a doable fee for the business community rather than setting it arbitrarily so high as to that we only want serious we only want serious business um, owners and I, I don't even know what that means because I you know I think that we have a community full of serious business owners but that doesn't mean that everyone can you know afford super high uh, business fees and so anyhow that's my other two cents and so thank you Jen for making that motion. Thank you, Councilmember Fulch. Well, I'll just say, you know, I, I do, I mean, I hear where everybody's coming from. We do want these businesses to be successful, successful, but our Public Safety Advisory Commission spent numerous hours into looking at the data from our surrounding communities, and they've worked really hard at it. Our Public Safety Committee of Council talked about it. That was a recommendation for $10,000. It was lowered last council meeting to eight. I understand where you're coming from. We, we know this is probably gonna change come in July. Just so people know that if we do have this fee, and it is, if the state says you can't 
charge more than $200, everything will be refunded. So I want people to know that. Correct? Mm -hmm. Clarification, it's prorated, right? It's prorated. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. yes. I just... So I want to be mindful of the hours that were put into it and the data that they su supplied us with um, for their recommendation. So there is a motion on the table and a second. Additional discussion council. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, state by saying aye. Aye. Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. 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 It's tied. It's a tie vote, so it stays at eight thousand no, dollars. No, it means you have oh. no second reading. Oh, we have, oh. It means you've not had a successful a second reading. So then you need a motion for the something. So I'll make a motion for the original. Original eight thousand dollar fee, and a second by Councilmember Pimble. All those in favor of that motion, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. Nay. Okay, and that motion prevails. We have a update on the flood forecast and response planning. And Dan, you may continue. Sure. Uh, this is informational. Um, appreciate the comments at the start of the meeting with public comments. This probably does not get into some of their specific areas, but uh, I know in the last week or two, um, there's been a lot of media attention uh, related to uh, a neighbor of ours, Stillwater, and uh, you know, what, what's going on in Hastings. And um, uh, Hastings and Stillwater are two different cities and two different rivers and two different, more importantly, two different profiles against the river. Uh, <clears throat> Stillwater is much flatter and lower to their river, as well as uh, a lot of that uh, low property is uh, municipal property uh, adjacent to the river. So their response, I think, is understandably um, a bit more immediate than we might have. Doesn't mean different, but immediate. Um, that said, uh, this is something that uh, city staff certainly have been aware of and continue to be aware of. We do look at the projections for uh, future fl flood levels, anticipate that we've had a, a you know, water every year and this year we've had a, an extraordinary amount of snowpack. I expect that uh, levels could well be higher than what we've seen recently, but um, it's tough to work from the projections. They're, they're far enough out that depending on additional precipitation we might have, including this week, and depending on the actual rate of the melt, uh, it's tough to look at something that's two or three weeks out. So although we're, we watch them, uh, the projections, it really is something that more when it's a week, week and a half that we start uh, looking more at what do we need to do to mobilize. Uh, we do have um, existing procedures uh, regarding um, uh, protection of public uh, property, public facilities. Uh, a lot of that's related to utilities, for example, sealing manholes so we don't suddenly have river water flooding out our stormwater system, uh, just as an example. But really, it's, it's much more utility-related, uh, physical infrastructure uh, owned and maintained by the city for the public benefit that are, the main focus is. Uh, we have had uh, some conversations, if it's last week or maybe late the week before, with Branch Line Church, uh, which has stepped up, uh, appreciate, appreciate their partnership, but they have stepped up in the past with uh, helping to mobilize volunteers, use their parking lot as a staging area so that if we did need to look at sandbag filling, for example, or some other work uh, specific to, to private property, um, we, we've at least made those initial contacts. We're not at the point of needing to do something there, um, uh, but we, we have had those contacts. Um, there was a question earlier, I can't answer in terms of what the response time would be, but there was a question about some of the um, 
emergency operations. We, as we do almost every year, uh, we do park a uh, police squad car with uh, some emergency medical equipment on the other side of the tracks. And it's partly related to the flood, but it's also if additional crossings might be blocked by a train, uh, wanting to make sure that uh, we don't have an, everything stranded on the, the west side, that we have some ability to, to have some emergency medical equipment on the east side of the tracks in, in an emergency. Um, uh, so there are steps like that that we've taken in the past and we continue to, to do so here. Um, uh, our, our, our public safety people, police and fire, certainly are in touch with the railroad. We can't tell them not to park, but we do remind them as we get to flood conditions. We have contact information that um, doesn't get an immediate train removal, but hopefully gets a quicker response than just calling the 1-800 the number. Um, but anyways, wanted to give you guys some update at the types of things that uh, public works, police, fire are looking at in order to be prepared for potential likely flood conditions um, and, and hopefully give some confidence to that. But with that, I can take some questions. I know uh, Public Works Director Stimsky and uh, Police Chief Wilski are also here if, if there's a more direct question for, for either of them. Great. Thank you, Dan. Council, any questions? Council Member Fulch. Thank you, Your Honor. I do have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one that I was concerned about was the in reading the memorandum, uh, it, there was a 50 to 75 percent uh, chance of major or I should say moderate f flooding. I'm just knowing this weekend it's going to be 60 degrees for a few days in a row. We're supposed to get more precipitation tomorrow. Things could go sideways. And so um, I was concerned about the wording in the memo, and so I'm looking for clarification. It said that the city will provide uh, sandbag materials um, and that you're talking to the church about um, them being a staging area, but in the last time that we had a major we had a major event, and I can't remember what year was it. Governor Walls came down. We had hundreds of people that came out, and we were sandbagging. What year was it? 19. 19. 19. 2019. Okay. Um, you know, the it was actually, it was the city public works that took the lead in, um, in, in our communications office and organizing. And, you know, I was there, you know, helping register volunteers. We had, you know, volunteers signing in. So we knew who was there for workers' compensation, you know, um, reasons. And people brought their own shovels and we just knocked it out, right? We were there for a couple hours. We got calluses. Life was good. And then in the end, we didn't need the sandbags, right? Because it was, you know, the thaw happened slow and thank God that that was mitigated. But it seems like we're going, um, this seems like a little bit more of a, a problematic situation where there is going to be. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that it's clear who's organizing, um, who's organizing the sandbagging because if if the city's saying we'll provide materials but we're not going to help organize the rest of it well do the council members have to personally step up and we'll organize Mary's good at organizing the rest of us are pretty good at it um, you know that we'll organize the sandbagging efforts or just you know what's the direction here I see Ryan you're stepping up yes thank you council member Fulch. thanks yeah mayor's member of the council Council Member Fulch. Um, the 2019 comparables, uh, you know, I looked at the same time the flood projections to the flood pro projections I provided in the memo. And the flood, thankfully, the, the flood projections are a little bit lower, you know, at the moderate level, not the major level. Um, j just for reference from 2019 to now, doesn't mean that can't go up or go down. Um, but they're usually fairly conservative uh, in the National Weather Service projections. As far as the sandbagging efforts go, um, like uh, City Administrator mentioned, we, we've already been in contact with Branch Line Church, so that's the first step of saying, okay, we've got our location. Um, we would, as the flood would progress, we would, at the public works level, uh, take the lead in the coordination and the efforts. Um, in association with Branch Line Church and other volunteering efforts to that, that be the central location that we would all gather. Um, 
for our efforts, we, we, we already have, the, we have 25,000 sandbags um, ready to be made. We have sand we can deliver. We've got poly, we've got big equipment, right? So uh, that church location's a great location to stage as, as you know, being there last time. It, so we've got our location, we've got our volunteer efforts that that effort would have to go out uh, as a focused effort, but we would we would provide those those resources as far as the materials. Our crews went do the literal sandbagging creation, and we went do the stacking on private property because we, um, from a liability standpoint, I don't want our crews going on private property and and that sort of thing anyway. Um, plus, we're we're a crew of under ten. <laughs> we only can we we got to be running around doing other things too. So this was a policy put in place years ago. We would provide those resources. We would have pallets then that are prepared of sandbags. We would deliver those with our loaders um, to the properties that need them at curbside. So that you know that's where our responsibility would end. Then the volunteer effort that helped make the sandbags and then bring them to the locations on the private properties would actually do that work when the sandbags were done. Those that are returned to curbside, we would pick up and bring those back for, for future use or recycling. So it is, it's a very coordinated effort of all those steps. I think the very first thing we would do as we watch week to week the flood stage predictions, we would, um, uh, probably the superintendent and myself would go door to door down there. And, and the first thing, lesson learned, would be I'd want to talk to the neighbors and say, where would they go? Do you want them? You know, those kinds of things. Because in the past, people have told me uh, they didn't want them on their property. So, you know, so, you know I, I think it's tough to predict perfectly, right? I think 90-some percent were returned that were made last time, and those all blew out and, and uh, disintegrated at our, at our salt shed. Um, so we just dumped the sand out and we used that for fill. But, you know, we want to be mindful of those efforts. But I think all the pieces are in place to stage and create and, and the volunteer, I mean, they, they've been great reaching out saying we can get resources. We said, great, you know, keep those on the line, but we're not quite there yet. Um, we would take the lead in the coordination, coordination setting meetings and getting those big equipments to get work done and help direction, so. Okay, terrific, thank you for that. And I'm sure many of us would volunteer to assist with that as well, so please keep us posted. It, it didn't say that in the memo. And then just to follow up on the residents' concerns, um, you know, as Bob had, uh, Mr. Majeski had uh, mentioned, I had actually gone out with him to drive that parcel of DNR land with him, and he drove in his pickup truck, and it, was it a 350 or a 150? It was like, it, it wasn't, it wasn't so, it was a 150, okay. So I thank you, because it wasn't like so enormous, like an, an ambulance is on a 350 chassis, right? And so, um, but he, both sides of his truck were being hit. There was so much buckthorn that was, you know, um, growing within that DNR land there that it was very clear to me if that, if action isn't taken, you know, to clear that land, there is going to be a major problem with um, vehicles not being able to traverse through that land, you know, into the future. And then I think, uh, and the second issue I just wanted to mention is that God bless Pete Likes for taking it upon himself to get that easement, you know, with the DNR, but he's a mortal person and I don't know what happens if something happens to Mr. Likes and then the public doesn't have the ability to get through there any longer. And so it's seems to me that it's a public safety issue that that we as a city should be investigating that we the city have a, an easement for the public to be able to go through that during um, you know an emergency flooding situation and and assist in and I know that city crews have ha helped you know to some capacity in the past with the um, putting up concrete barriers to stop the public from going in and all of that but I would I and I would, and I think that the staff is looking for direction as well from other council members. So it's not just Tina being a squeaky wheel here about what it is, you know, what is the city's obligation to the residents that are out in Cowtown, especially on the far reaches of Fourth Street? Because I can't imagine as a parent, like how, um, 
awful that has to feel to know that your home is disconnected from public safety measures in, you know, when the flooding occurs. And so I think that um, we have an obligation to our residents. Um, if, it, if we're not able to raise the road in the next, you know, in the near future, what is it that we can do to help assure that they have safe passage during the flooding period through that DNR easement? And obviously the DNR is open to having those conversations if they're allowing uh, an individual to have an easement, you know, on that. And so, um, so there's that. And I don't know if we need to have further conversation if you have, you know, thoughts about that matter, but I think it's, it, it is really concerning. And, and I know it's not on the, uh, on the capital improvements project list, you know, to to raise Fourth Street at this time, but uh, community development John Hinsman, we did have conversations about where is it that we could apply, we could have more residential homes built within the city's existing limits, right? There's not a lot of spots, but there is a spot. There are parcels that are out in that, that region that John had said, yes, there could be more residential development built out there. And it's beautiful. I had never been out there until Bob brought me to the far reaches of it. And it's absolutely beautiful, that, back, that backwoods neighborhood area. So that said, <clears throat> I just think that there is an opportunity to keep our eye that if, um, if folks knew that they could build out there and that they had safe passage 300 and, you know, 62 days a year, right? You know, rather than, oh God, every, you know, so many years we're not gonna be able to get out to our homes for a month, right? That we could help, you know, ensure more residential development out there. And so, um, so with that said, I would love to hear from other council members. I had invited that. I wanted to make sure that we had uh, the residents had the opportunity to speak and uh, the folks who are down between First and Second Street for you to hear personally uh, just the, 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 you know, really the cries for help that they're, they're looking for um, us to be supportive of them. I've never, in all the door knocking I've done in the last six years that I've been running for office, I've never heard so much anxiety from a group of neighbors as I hear from the east side, the Cowtown neighborhood. I mean, it's not like anywhere else, not, not in anywhere else in Hastings, anywhere in Denmark Township, Nininger, Cottage Grove that I've been at. There's a lot of anxiety and I just think that it's really um, prudent for us to be cognizant of that and to, you know, and to let them know that we're real, really here for them. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Fulch. Council Member Lund. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I don't know if necessarily this is the pulling this from the, the agenda and then discussing a tangential thing, but I will say that, um, you know, my thoughts are, uh, you know, have the Ops Committee meet at, at our, you know, regular or whatever. That I don't know the dates of the upcoming ones, but um, I think it's a completely legitimate conversation to have. There's multiple issues to discuss. Some of them are long term, some of them are short term. Um, but that'll give, I think, you'll give Ryan plenty of time to pull some information together too. Because there's obviously, it's not just uh, you know, straightforward. There's a lot of people, different entities involved and whatnot too. So that was my thought. Um, but I'll end my conversation on the subject right now. Thank you, Councilmember Lund. The next um, Ops Committee meeting is August 14th. So if need be, we can possibly organize another meeting prior to that. Thank you. Any other discussion, Council? Chief Wilski, did you have anything to add? Mayor, Council members, thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to share a few more things in regards to this. Uh, there was a question in regards to why do we park an emergency vehicle on that side of the tracks and, and how would we use that? Uh, there are times that the train uh, has to stop for the switch, and, and this we know, and sometimes they do block that passage for that roadway for an extended period of time. Uh, we have little control over that. Obviously, uh, a train accident is not something that we want when we're dealing with a flood too, so I understand why they have to stop. 
the expectation is that public safety would, would cross the tracks even with a train stop there. Is it dangerous? It absolutely is. But we would do that in the event of an emergency. That's why we have that emergency equipment. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to comment is that the Likes family and others that live in that community are very resourceful. I know this because I've worked with them in the past. We had a missing person. They were extremely helpful with us in locating that person. Uh, and they always find a way, which I'm very appreciative of. And we will find a way as well. Uh, as we prepare for the potential for flooding, and I say potential because the model is, is ever-changing. We don't know, uh, and we can attest from this weekend that Mother Nature is playing games with us, right? Uh, so we don't know what to expect. Uh, I am working on the operations plan, which we have developed every year. And just one other comment in regards to sandbagging, I do have to throw out there that the Ministerial Association is a big part of that in coordinating that every year. They were in 2019. They will be if we have a sandbagging event again this year. So just so the council knows that this is at the top of our priority list. We are watching, we are ready, uh, just like every year when, uh, you know, when we expect a melt. So thank you for that thank opportunity. You, thank you. So, Council, this was pulled from the consent agenda, so I would need a motion to accept the report. Councilmember Fulch. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll make a, in a, um, a motion to accept the report. Okay, thank you. And Councilmember Fulch, additional new discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. Uh, Dan. You may continue with the no wake ordinance. Sure. Um, about two years ago, maybe even a little over two years ago, uh, we had several residents uh, approach the, I don't recall if they approached the Public Safety Committee of Council or if they approached Council and referred it to Public Safety, but the, the main discussion was at Public Safety Committee. Um, uh, they brought a recommendation back to council saying uh, recognize that this is uh, outside the city's jurisdiction. It's something that uh, would require uh, the county and actually the two counties, since there's two sides to the river, uh, needing them to coordinate um, and council asked staff to follow up with Dakota and Washington counties about uh, their adopting, potentially adopting, uh, some sort of restrictions on boat speeds and wakes um, coming through town or coming through Hastings here. Uh, concerns about erosion as well as um, damage to boats and docks and potentially even um, swamping boats or knocking people off of docks. So some safety concerns. Uh, Chief Schaefer, I know, had several conversations with uh, both departments. Um, I think it was... I'm characterizing here, but I think it was more uh, uh, received more uh, accommodatingly from Dakota County Sheriff's Department. Uh, there was a process that they wanted to go through, including studying um, boat speeds and getting some actual data to, to work with in order to determine the um, uh, need for uh, a, 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 an ordinance rather than just putting an ordinance in place. Uh, as recent as uh, mid-summer 22, I think it still looked promising with Dakota County, uh, although Washington County was, was certainly reluctant. And then by late summer, early fall, uh, Dakota County uh, said that uh, they're not seeing the public safety need for this uh, and uh, said that they're not taking it any further. Uh, I know that a, a few times throughout that couple year process, I gave some very brief updates to council in a three on Thursday or a tracking report, talked to a couple of you one on one, but never gave the sort of the final, here's the bad news, not, not what we hope, but never brought that full circle and back to council. So there was a request to put this on the agenda and give you that update. Um, but that's essentially where it's, where it is is uh, it, it's not our jurisdiction, and the the two counties, or the two county sheriff's departments, are not interested in going further with it. I can take some questions. I know Chief Wilski certainly talked with uh, his his counterparts at the county level, uh, including I think as recent as last week on this subject. So, if you have questions, please. Thank you, Dan. 
Council Member Fulch. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I pulled this issue because it was, uh, you know, constituents that are in the east side Cowtown uh, neighborhood that first uh, brought this forward that live along uh, First Street and then additional, additionally the owners of the marinas have come forward. Um, it, all you got to do is walk down there and see the erosion that's occurring um, from folks going too fast along the river uh, with day-to-day -day, uh, boat traffic. And so um, in the memo here it says that the sheriff's um, are only observing erosion issues when the, river, when the river levels are too high and that there's not a public safety issue here. And so, I mean, that, I'm sorry, that's a bunch of baloney, in my opinion, uh, when we have folks who are coming forward and, and multiple times, over and over, every few, so many years, coming forward and asking for us to do something about the erosion, about the safety issues, about when people are down um, at their boat at their boat docks, um, with you know individual uh, boats going by um, at fast speeds, and uh, and in the in the safety uh, repercussions of that. Um, you know, it affects our tourism. We have a boat dock that's down, you know, at the base of the confluence there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and I'm told I, I don't have a boat myself, but I'm to told by folks that do have boats that uh, we don't see Prescott, you know, day drinkers, you know, coming over to Hastings because it's not safe for them to be able to dock their boats on that public dock and tie them off because there's no wake. There's not a no wake. There's not a no wake zone there. And you know, individual boats can just zip right by and you know, and, and knock their any parked uh, boats that are on that public dock. And so it affects our downtown tourism opportunities as well. So there's an economic impact there. I mean, if you guys have never gone over to Prescott on a, a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And, and looked at all of the tourism that comes from the boat traffic and their marinas, you know, I would recommend you to do so. And so I think that um, it's very troubling. The Dakota County Sheriff's Office, they told us that they were doing a speed study. Where is the speed study? I personally spoke to Sheriff Leslie. I personally spoke to uh, Washington County uh, Sheriff Starry about it. I caught him at a Cottage Grove parade and cornered them, you know, and and so it's really troubling that both of these sheriffs. I personally asked them, and they said that this uh, this re review was going forward when uh, the now sheriff Flecko was uh, running for office last fall. I asked him where it was because he was the number two to Sheriff Leslie, and he said that they were working on it as well. So where's the data? Where's the study? Where's the information that shows? What has gone on so far? And I'm sorry, this this memo just just infuriates me that you know that residents for the last over a decade have multiple times have come forward asking for this and um, for it just to be, you know, uh, to, for it to just to be so flippantly disregarded, you know, in this format. And I know Chief Wolski, it's not you, but it just I am personally upset that we would be treated with. Um, such little respect as to disregard the concerns that our business community and our residents have brought forward, um, stating, you know, obviously that is an erosion and it's a safety issue, and for for them to say, nope, sorry, we don't see that at all, and 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 just to say, game over. So I'd really like to know, you know, what are the the next steps? Do we need to, you know, get, you know, do we have to get a petition going? You know, what is it going to take? to get the sheriff's office, you know, to be serious about moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fulch. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome. If I could respond, and, and I understand your fr frustration, Council Member Fulch, and I will take responsibility for that memo. And, and I say that because uh, this uh, topic came up uh, late last week, and so I, I did talk to both sheriffs, and I continue to talk, to talk to both sheriffs. I will say the process. Let's talk about the process first. And the ultimate decider is the Department of Natural Resources. That's who decides whether there is going to be change on a waterway. Now, that proposal can come from the city. That can come from the counties. Um, and that those are really our options based on our geography. And there's a process on the DNR's website on how to complete, receive that packet, and then and then put in uh, for that decision if you want to no know wake. Uh, I will defend 
uh, Sheriff Lico. I have been speaking with Sheriff Lico. He is more than willing to talk about this and continue this conversation. Uh, I do think that we would have to talk to some of those affected parties and figure out what the complaint is. And I say that because I'm not an expert when it comes to erosion. Uh, I can speak on the public safety. We have a, a different uh, geography than Prescott does. We don't have those same parking abilities, uh, abilities that they do uh, because of the 90 degree turn in the river and it's more narrow. So all that is taken into account when they're making some of these decisions. The request, the current request uh, in years past for the no wake is approximately 1.2 miles. That would add about 30 to 40 minutes of travel time. So for that action, if we were to enact a no wake and it was approved by the DNR, what is the reaction gonna be? Are boaters uh, going to be less likely to come to uh, this landing because of that time that it takes? I mean, there's a lot of things that, that play into that. So what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is we can continue that discussion. I know that uh, Sheriff Lico didn't mention to me today via text that, that he will reach out to you and have that conversation or at least start that conversation. So that is the process. I wanna make, sure every, make sure everyone's clear on that. Uh, it's not up to me. It's not up to uh, just enacting an ordinance. It's up to the DNR and somebody has to actually make that petition to the DNR and let them respond. Your Honor, may I speak? Okay, thank you. Yes, Councilman thank you, Your Honor. So, um, uh, Chief Schaefer, before he had retired, he had um, made it very clear that the Sheriff's Department was um, under, that they had underway already taken the steps, that the Dakota County Sheriff's Office was taking the lead, and that they were conducting a speed study. That's what we were told a couple of times. They're going to do a speed study to see what was the proper um, what would be the, you know, depending on how the river flows and all of that, I'm not a boater, like I had said, but that they had to like ascertain really what would be the right speed considering the current there and such and what the signage would be and such. And so that they were, um, they were going through these steps. And so we've been, I mean, we've been waiting a long time. The results were supposed to have come back a year ago with the results of that study. And so that's where I'm just like completely flabbergasted that, um, that this was supposed to have been moving on and that everybody was on the same page and even Washington County Sheriff's Office for the first time ever was willing to, you know, talk about this further and that seemed like a miracle unto itself and then um and then for just a just crash like what like we didn't have all these conversations and it just seems like like what in god's name just has occurred that um we were being told that we were walking down this process and that once the speed study was done then the the, the D D dakota county sheriff's office would then apply to the dnr for the you know, for the proper permitting and such to be done. And so that's where it, it just seems very, you know, disconnected. And I understand that there's been some handoffs of the baton between yourself and um, Chief Schaefer, and then also with the, the Sheriff's Office. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry if I sound a little completely frazzled, because I do feel frazzled in that um, what, from what you just said, it sounds like it never got off first base, that we never you know, that we were given lip service and that it really wasn't moving along at any given point. And so that's why I'm, I'm just like completely thrown off base by why it is that nothing has proceeded. You know, it's like, do, do we have to ask for a formal, you know, data practices, you know, disclosure of any correspondences that were in regards to this? I mean, I don't want to have to go to that point, but it's like, it seems to me that it's, it's troubling that, um, to have had all parties saying that things are moving forward and then to hear that nothing had moved forward. Yeah, so uh, I am continuing to search for some of those documents, I'll be honest with you, and I, I believe Sheriff Lico is doing the same. So I know that they reached out, I did find some documents the other day, they did reach out about signage, like who could post signage even if this was enacted because you can't put buoys there because of the width of the river and the barge traffic. And I know that railroad uh, would not allow that and I think they were gonna to talk to some private entities about posting the no wake. So I know things like that were taking place. Uh, so I don't wanna say the baton was dropped, but we have to continue that conversation. And uh, while we're sitting here uh, 
as I'm communicating with Sheriff Lico, we're going to work on setting that up. You know, because part of this is we have to get Washington County on board as well. And there is an enforcement piece that comes along with it too. So this is more of a heavy lift for the counties that they have to take into account as well. Uh, if we don't have both counties in agreement, then it's probably less likely DNR would approve that. One other thing that I'd like to mention, just for clarification, when we reach flood stage in the St. Croix, that goes into an immediate no wake. For the Mississippi, that is not the case. And both sheriffs really commented on that and said they would encourage a no wake when we reach a certain flood stage, but not necessarily, um, and I'm just trying to be transparent, not necessarily across the board a no wake. So currently right now when we reach flood stage, we, a no wake is not enacted. And that was news to me. So that, that might be somewhere where we meet in the middle, and I don't know what, uh, what the flavor is on council is on that, but uh, it's, it's an interesting aspect that we could look at. Because that's when I can really see the erosion when we reach that certain threshold. Now what is that number? I don't know. We'd have to research that and figure out what flood stage would we enact that no wake. And then it, it could be enforceable as well by both counties. Okay. Well, it's, um, Your Honor, may I speak? So it's my understanding, you know, that flood stage only happens for a few weeks of the given year, and it doesn't necessarily happen every particular year where it's like, you know, to the to the state where it's, you know, like this year where there's a moderate level of flooding. And so when you talk to the residents and the individuals, you know, that you know, like the, the hubs marina and such, you know, it's the day to day. It's a nice day. And folks are just zipping by at unreasonable speeds and the amount of wake that's caused, you know. And so um, and, and I and, you know, for the most part, I can't imagine that people are recreational boating during a major flood, right? You know, it's kind of hard to avoid hitting trees and things of that nature that are floating, right? And so it's, so the chances of, you know, heavy boat traffic during a flood are low, right? Where folks are out recreating. You know, when you talk to individuals, it's really, it's the day-to-day -day people are enjoying, you know, the river and, and going by at, at quick speeds. And so that's what they're, you know, uh, when they have stories to say, oh my God, you wouldn't believe the, you know, what had happened and we had the situation and this boat went flying past and, you know, people almost fell in the water, people got hurt and things of that nature. I mean, that's what they're really, you know, upset about. And so I would, you know, thank you, Chief Wilski. I'm not trying to persecute you because I know you do a wonderful job and I always appreciate you in so many ways. Um, but it is just uh, frustrating and, it, and, it, it, and I believe it's a disser disservice to our residents when, it keeps just getting, you know, the, you know, pushed forward every couple of years, or, or ignored, I should say. So thank you so much for everything you do. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Fulch. Thank you, Chief. Council, any announcements? No. All right, I have a couple. Hastings Area Earth Day birding festivities at Carpenter's St. Croix Nature Center on Saturday, April 22nd. Guided birding field trips, birding banding demonstrations, raptor presentation, and pre-registration is preferred, please. Adult softball and sand volleyball league on forming, are forming now. Please go to the city website to register. Hastings residents can drop off yard waste at the Minnesota Coaches Parking Lot off Commerce Drive on Wednesdays 3 to 7 and Saturdays 8 to 2. Weather permitting, grass clippings and leaves should be, leaved, should be in the compatible paper bags or reusable containers. Plastic bags and loose materials are not accepted. Brush should be cut to four foot lengths, no branches more than three inches in diameter, and bundles not more than 40 pounds. Meetings coming forward Wednesday, April 5th, Finance Committee at 7 p.m., Monday, April 10th, 7 p.m., Planning Commission, 7 p.m., Administration Committee, Wednesday, April 12th, 6 p.m., Arts and Culture Commission, Thursday, April 13th, Hedra at 6 p.m. Monday, April 17th, 7 p.m. will be our next city council meeting. Motion to adjourn, council. So moved, Your Honor. 
Councilmember Leifeld and Councilmember Pemble. No discussion. We are adjourned.